Well, greetings, investors, and welcome to the March 2017 edition of the Roundtable. Uh, the cover slide is is basically just paying homage to the dying of the Chicago River Green just a few days ago. As Herb and others have pointed out, we're actually closer to April Fool's Day, so you guys can pick your holiday. We had hoped that he would be joining us tonight, but he's still uh, he's still definitely globe trotting. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm managing partner of Manifest Investing and a longtime participant in the Modern Investment Club movement through a number of things, including volunteer activities in Chicago and other places. I'm joined by my friend Ken Kabula from Mid Michigan. Uh, Ken is widely known around the country for his educational presentations, and the same is true of Cy Lynch of Atlanta. Welcome both of you tonight, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Mark. Glad to be thanks here. a lot, Mark. Well, tonight I thought we'd just simply keep keep the program fairly simple. It is March Madness. I've joked about it. Uh, in, during March Madness, I either grab a snack or go to the bathroom every four minutes during the TV timeouts, and uh, the basketball has been entertaining and it is kind of a fun time of year for basketball it's also a fun time as uh, m many of us most of us have probably finished doing our taxes and our investing refunds and that sort of thing as, as we go along but uh, let's take care of some of the legal paperwork first again this uh, presentation is an example of the type of presentation we've been making for a few years now where we actually use real stocks and use them in case studies no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. This is all about educating and demonstrating the techniques, methods, processes, and philosophies of the Modern Investment Club movement as demonstrated by George Nicholson, his colleagues, and NEIC slash Better Investing. So again, everything that we do here, please do your own homework. We, uh, we basically use real companies, real data, real analysis, uh, it doesn't mean they're right. It means that we're just basically showing how we look at these companies and basically find common ground when reaching decisions, either with our individual portfolios or when working with a group of investors known as an investment club or an investment partnership. Here's our standing agenda that we're going to go through uh, tonight. Again, we try to keep these to about 75 minutes, and we do have an open Q&A at the end, but start with just this introduction again if you're new here we try to keep it fairly informal you can communicate with us through the chat box you can also raise your hand and at times we'll go un uh, unmuted and, and audible if you have microphone equipment but again you can uh, participate uh, we will take questions and answers at the end and they, on a range of subjects including things that we cover here tonight if you're here for the first time when we do the audience poll you are invited and welcome to participate. We're just glad that you're here. We'll spend some time talking about what we've been doing for the last, we're coming up on uh, seven or eight years of doing this on a monthly basis, how we've done. Then we'll go into the stock presentations. Ken is going to repeat uh, CVS. I think that's a three-time pick so far. Sai is going to repeat a selection of EPAM systems, and I'm going to come with microchipped technology. We do have the poll, and then, as I said, we will open the floor up. The image on the upper right is also one that kind of comes around this time of the year for those of you that are uh, fans of Gene Hackman and the, the movie Hoosiers. Uh, I wrote an article just a few years ago about how the small town team, for those that haven't seen the movie, it's about a, a town with a population of about 200 back in Indiana in the 1950s that ends up in the high school state basketball championship. So he's got these kids. There were six, I think there were six boys on the basketball team. And uh, they're walking in and they're playing this, you know, powerhouse from South Bend, Notre Dame High School or, or whatever. And uh, the, the six boys, you know, their jaws are literally dragging across the floor in this massive field house. And what Hackman has them do is measure the distance from the free throw line to the hoop. And then the, the, different, the distance that the, the hoop is up from the floor, basically confirming that it's still 10 feet, it's still 15 feet this basketball court is no different. And again, I think the message for us as investors is we do try to identify, again, using those lessons in the, the philosophy of the modern investment club movement is what's important, what, what do we need to really care about, and we measure it and keep track of it. And uh, I just think that's a real powerful theme that aligns itself fairly well with March Madness. 
Here's what we've been doing on a monthly basis, again, for over seven years. Uh, we do come together. We will talk about uh, case studies and educational stuff, but we do focus in on sharing single favorite investment opportunities. We try to keep them to uh, uh, the majority of them to core holdings that you would identify with as upstream and parallel, fairly consistent business models. Every once in a while, we will uh, dabble in the non-core, more speculative type of thing. Uh, Hugh McManus has made a living doing that. Uh, as one example would be Bank of America six years ago and nobody could stand even think about it. He was adding it to our tracking portfolio and uh, that has worked out pretty well for him and us. We do keep track. We'd like to see the overall portfolio on average beat the, the market by five percentage points. That's that long-term relative return of five percent that you see in the middle of the page. We track it versus the Wilshire 5000, specifically the index fund that goes by the with the ticker VTSMX, Vanguard Total Stock Market X, VTSMX. We do like to see the picks that we make out, outperform the market, and we'd like to see that happen a, a majority of the time. We'd be happy with 60 to 70 percent uh, just for, for giggles and, and context. Uh, the average investor literally operates down around 25, 30, maybe 40 percent most of the time. The an average investor in the Motley Fool's Caps experiment basically sees one out of every three selections beat the market because in many cases the average investor, that's none of us here, the average investor is chasing hot stock tips. In many cases they're speculating on stocks that have already run up pretty significantly, that sort of thing, and their track record is is actually pretty dismal. If you look at the DALBAR, that's D-A-L-B-A-R results that come out every year about this time, uh, the average investor underperforms the stock market by anywhere from 6 to 8 percentage points over the long term. That's per year. So that's, uh, that's what we try to lean on each other. Again, the philosophy and techniques and methods to avoid falling into those traps. Here's our results. Um, we have managed to actually outperform the market by a little over a percentage point. We're coming up on two percentage points here. Uh, just to, again to give you context that this two percent is not the return on the portfolio. The return on the portfolio on an absolute basis, this is per year, is the rate of return at 12.3 percent. This relative return is how much do we beat the market by? And again on a monthly month, month by month basis here, Again, you see that we're about 1.6 percentage points ahead of the market. We, we want to be in this positive territory, and frankly, we want to be up at this dotted line at 5%. When we achieve that, I'm pretty confident we will, um, we'll be 5 percentage points better than the market over the entire time we've been doing this. And uh, as you can see, the outperformance accuracy about, is about 50%. Uh, and again, give that some time. That's a work in progress also. Any comments or questions, Ken, at this point? I just am very pleased that we, our relative return has remained positive throughout most of this experiment. Uh, it's a, a great thing to be able to point to. Uh, and just reminding people that this is not the kind of portfolio that you'd put together in an investment club. Uh, this is a tracking portfolio. It has lots and lots of stocks in it but we don't think it's fair to pick stocks and talk about stocks and then not keep track of how they do. So that's exactly the purpose of a tracking portfolio, to tell you how our, uh, how our ideas have done over the last five, six, seven years. I, I can't believe it's been almost seven years now that we're pushing towards Mark. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. It is. And, you know, it started with, all right, I'll do it, but no costumes. Um, <laughs> that was from who? That was from you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and the other and another another thing to to consider, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of our our good friend and colleague um, Julie Werner from south of here, um, and she talks about how the bear markets of you know eighty seven but primarily uh, the 2000 bust and then 2008 were, she calls them trampolines that, that allowed her to use uh, one of Mark's uh, cliches or, or metaphors of backing up the truck. 
and and being able to get a good boom out of the market and I think also uh, the high quality stocks do better in a down market than the market as a whole um, what I'm where I'm going with all of this if you run seven years back this has been in one of the longest bull markets of history we have not had a full down and up market yet and I think that uh, that trampoline effect as well as the safety factor of not going down as much as the market generally may well get us to that 5% line when and if or when we have a true bear and bull market cycle. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair point. And also, an homage to you, uh, left uh, a, a few more months off the front end of this because you were saying, well, we shouldn't even be keeping track of performance for the first year or two. Or not really. We should just be building and collecting good ideas. And what you're saying, we actually have seen with our 10-cup model portfolio back in that 2008-2009 time frame. Boy, did it ever boomerang or trampoline back up, uh, basically right. getting back to even a lot faster than Jim Cramer did. Um, so, yeah, I want to be real quiet and not wish for uh, another great uh, recession, but at the <laughs> same time, 2009 was just uh, one of the best years for me in investing that I've had through my entire investment career, which, which date backs to about 1987 when I started investing. So, it It is an important notion and concept. I mean, we can, you know, together we can prepare so that we fall, you know, lose less, and actually trampoline back out of it. I mean, that's what this is all about, and I hope you're right. I hope we do see that red line as a result of something like that. By the way, there's nothing great about a recession. I don't know why they put great on that. <laughs> all right, here's a, here's a look at the actual the most influential stocks in the portfolio. Again, this is a tracking portfolio. What we do is every time a stock is selected or nominated, including selections by the audience, guest damsels, guest knights. We put $1,000 into them. And uh, if, if you want to check and see how many times we've invested in any one of these, you can go to that public link up at the top of the page. Just click through on it. It's, it's a direct link from our homepage also. And uh, that public link will take you to a display of, I think there's 98 stocks in the portfolio now. And... Uh, there's also a legend that will show you how many times each one has been chosen. In the case of Cognizant Technology up at the top, it's been chosen 12 times. So $12,000 invested has become 18000 And you can just basically break it down. But these are the stocks that are going to be the most uh, influential. One of the things that just warms, the, warms me to the bottom of my heart is to see the Mesa Labs and the NICs and the NetEases and, you know, the smaller companies in here keeping our overall growth rate. Ken, would you like to discuss the condition of the portfolio? Or Well, you, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased with our uh, overall numbers. Uh, our growth is still a little bit less than I'd like it to be. I, I really would like to see the growth, uh, even though this is a tracking portfolio, I'd like to see the growth a little bit closer, 10 and a half, maybe 11%. That's referring to sales growth, folks. That's that number that's circled in orange right down the middle of the bottom down there. We're at 9.7. Uh, that's a weighted average. So Cognizance 12% growth contributes more to that number than uh, one of the one-time picks might. Um, and I'd like to see it a little bit a healthier, a little bit bigger, but it's not a bad number. Uh, our quality is superb up at 88 right there. And, you know, I think our par value is just a tenth or two off of what par actually is, what my par was uh, at the close of trading today. My par has been hanging around 10.5, 10.6. Uh, remember, that's a measure of the average potential return for the stocks in the Manifest Investing Database. That's what my par is. And uh, at 10.4, we're just about hitting five points uh, above uh, the market. Uh, the market average has been around 5.5, 5, 5.6, 5, 5, 5, 7, somewhere in that particular neighborhood now for I'm going to guess four or five months, Mark. Am I a little bit short or am I coming close? What do you think? It's definitely bottomed in that, hopefully bottomed in that area. So, 
Okay. I, I do want to put an advertisement out there. If you look at the third stock on the list, it's Priceline. Uh, it's, some people say it's a very expensive stock. Uh, well, price-wise, it's a very expensive stock, $1,700 plus dollars a share. PE-wise, it's not, uh, not up there with the, the, the top stocks in the universe. But I'm going to do a, a fairly deep dive on Priceline on the 12th of April at the monthly stock-up session. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about Priceline, I'm going to take a look at some of the adjustments that it's made recently to its earnings and whether I agree with all of those adjustments or not. And then I'm going to make some estimations on where I think Priceline will be uh, three or four or five years from now. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be uh, telling any truths outside of of school when I say that my par value will probably end up being fairly close uh, to the par value that you see in manifest investing. Uh, I find that the SSGs I do 90%, 90% plus of the time uh, do end up a percentage or two one way or the other uh, from the manifest par value. So that's on April 12th. Uh, starts at 8.30 Eastern Time, so if you'd like to come and listen to that Priceline presentation, we'd love to have you. Cool, and one thing I thought I might reinforce just for, um, in case we do have some newcomers, <coughs> we, we don't do the same type of zoning that are, is done on a traditional stock selection guide. Instead, we basically are looking at, you know, the context of the overall market and we color code these projected annual returns over here on the right. If they're color coded in green and bolded up, that means that they're probably or would likely to be in the buy zone on a stock selection guide, as Ken was saying, as price line is somewhere in that perhaps 12% range. So if, if we had a buy zone, it would simply be this thing that we call the sweet spot, uh, attractive enough, high enough of a return forecast or a par that it's attractive, but not too high. The ones that are color-coded in yellow are just simply be careful out there. Um, the, they could be speculative, could be a situation where the, another shoe is yet to drop. Uh, when you have that situation, you definitely want to be demanding high quality. But, you know, that is the type of zoning. We do rely on that, that par or that return forecast as a decision trigger for us. Um, in the buying and selling of stocks. And uh, again, if they're color coded in green, they're in this thing called the sweet spot, that means they're in that five to 10 percentage points better than the average stock in the market and you know, worthy of our attention and, and deeper study is kind of the way we look at it. Well, and I'm looking at the ones, Mark, that are coded yellow. Uh, and when you have a stock that's coded yellow, you like to see a really, really high quality accompany it. So when I see Mesa Labs coded yellow, which means it's more than 10 points above the market average, uh, I'm comparing that to its quality, which is also very, very high. And I'm saying it doesn't bother me nearly as much as if Mesa Labs had a 19% par with a 45% uh, quality. Mm -hmm. uh, when, that, when that quality starts to dip, especially when it dips below 50 uh, I don't want to look at a yellow stock uh, that much, but I'm looking at the four yellows that we have here, and I happen to own three of them. So I, I would suggest that you'll get some great-looking stock selection guys out of uh, uh, Ulta Salons and out of NIC and out of Mesa Labs. Uh, you know, Mark, I own all four of them uh, because the fourth one is Amazon. I didn't read that correctly with my bifocals here. So uh, I think all four of those would give you some interesting SSGs. Uh, Amazon is going to be a little bit out of the ordinary. You're not going to see the kind of up straight and parallel that the other three will exhibit. But Amazon is certainly a disruptive technology that you need to do some thinking about as you put your thesis for investing together. Yeah, and what Ken is pointing out is there is no earnings stability at Amazon. Right there. That's a percentile ranking. It's among the lower companies out there. It's a very bumpy ride. And again, the, the rest of the story with Amazon is they don't care about earnings yet. So that, that number gets a little bit beat up. 
one other heads up that I'll give the audience, because I know there's quite a few Mesa Lab shareholders out there. We, we're going through and doing some soul searching and spring cleaning at Manifest Investing, and I think you can be on the watch for a slight, slight reduction in fundamentals at Mesa Labs as we study it more carefully and and bring a little bit stronger trend analysis to play here. I think you're going to see Mesa Labs take a little bit of a fundamental hit um, in the, the next update when it comes out. Mark, we do have a we do have a question as to why the uh, color for the quality number for Amazon is green rather than blue, and the blue is reserved, Bonnie, for uh, uh, 80 and above, and be from I think it's from what from 70 to 80 mark it it turns green, which oh, no. means it's Six, good. 60 to 80, it's quintiles. 60 to 80, it's quintiles. Okay, so it 60 to 80, it turns green, which means it's still pretty decent, pretty good company. Uh, and then it'll turn black uh, when it gets below 60, and then it'll go all the way down to 20, and at 20 it'll turn red. So um, the the color is just kind of trying to keep you honest as you're looking at, at stocks quality-wise. Notice that universal display up there hasn't quite hit the 80th percentile as far as companies in the database and their quality, so it's still green uh, with a quality of 79. Another extremely interesting company that's been on a tear recently. Uh, I hope that some of you actually have OLED in your portfolios because you've made some real cash uh, in the last six months or so. Good stuff. All right, we probably better press on. We can come back and, and handle more Q&A and discuss some things in general, but let's go ahead and do the stock presentation. Sai's si going to come back with EPAM systems selection that he made last month. Was that the, a repeat or was that new last month, Sai? It was new last month. So okay. This is, this is the double down repeat. Um, I think I convinced you last month this is not uh, cognizant in disguise, although it is in the same general industry. But EPAM Systems uh, is the second pick this month. I'll be a little briefer in the description of the company uh, than uh, last month, but we will um, introduce those of you who don't know the company and refresh your memory for the rest of them. But as you can see, uh, the stock selection guide graph on the, the front side, if you will, that's up on the screen showing sales and earnings is a n pretty nice up straight and parallel time frame, although it is <clears throat> a relatively limited history um, in that it's less than 10 years of publicly trading information, the company itself has been around for about 23 years, so it is not a, a new company. Next slide. Um, what I decided to do this month uh, was to take a look at uh, current holdings, and I had to had a pretty good idea that I might come back to uh, EPAM since it was a good stock last month and not anything significant had happened either price-wise or business-wise. This is the current holdings in uh, the roundtable ranked by PAR, and you see that the second highest PAR is EPAM Systems. Uh, just to follow up a bit on the previous comments uh, that we were talking about, yellow zones. This is a rather high yellow. Uh, in fact, it, you notice that it's actually a little over 20 points above my par and certainly could be nosebleed territory. I'd point out a couple of things about it. First of all, notice the asterisk beside the name. That says that it is not followed in the value line standard edition. And so it can be more susceptible to wide variances of analyst uh, coverage, sometimes not heavily covered. Now, EPAM does have uh, in the upper teens covering it, so it's not a, it, it does have some level of coverage, uh, but it's still uh, the, the um, um, consensus forecast may have a wider range than than a, a value line standard edition company. It's also a smaller company uh, as well. And as I talk through my judgments, you'll see that it comes down off the, the yellow. And I'll also reinforce why I think the yellow should not scare us away, although I think that uh, some of the 
um, consensus analysis that underlies that 27.8 par may be a little frothy. Uh, but notice again, as Ken was saying, you've got an 86 quality, so it's an outstanding quality company. And by the way, that's with a um, deduction for shorter uh, history than uh, Manifest likes to see for um, for setting a, a full range. I won't get into the the full calculation nitty gritty of that, but if you look at the um, stock page on Manifest Investing, you'll see that deduction. So uh, it's still a very high quality company. Notice also the financial strength, which I like to look at as another subcategory is 85%. That's a percentile ranking. So that's a very high quality company, which again <clears throat> gives me some uh, peace of mind, even though it's a relatively uh, high flyer from a par standpoint. Next slide. Just to make sure there was nothing uh, out uh, in Solomon that might be attractive, I did, again, my quick uh, basic screen of a little under my par plus five, which was 10.5% today. Uh, excellent quality and an 80 financial strength. And you can see EPAM Systems came in at the highest par and all of the same analysis of the yellow that I just mentioned would go into this screen. Next slide. Here's the introduction to the company. It's a um, IT consulting company like Cognizant, like uh, Infosa Systems, like um, Deloitte Touche and, and other uh, companies out there. As I mentioned, it has 23 years of uh, business experience. They serve, they're a relatively large uh, company with, uh, as far as number of employees, they're spread throughout the country. They actually started in the former Soviet Union area, and much of their employees are still focused in that area, which is a little unlike many of the IT companies that, that have concentrations either here in the United States or in India or South, South Asia, but they are spread throughout the world. And they... Uh, <clears throat> serve a wide range of industries, and I believe I have a graph that shows that a little bit better. And there's a couple of um, awards that the uh, company likes to point out that it has Forbes uh, fastest growing companies and a top IT company on Fortune 100. Next slide. This again is, is just a little bit uh, of a graphic or more pictorial um, indication of the industries that they're in. But notice uh, what I like about this slide is it shows that they have clients that are the leading companies within their industries, five of the 10 largest banks, 10 of the top 10 pharma companies, and so forth you can see in that slide. So they have high quality companies that they service. Next slide. Again, here's the geography, primarily North America, but a um, healthy a share in Europe, a little bit in Asia, which is the red at the bottom, and then the um, CIS, the Commonwealth uh, States, which is the former Soviet Union. And again, you can see the industry um, breakout is uh, relatively balanced. So again, they're not dependent on any single industry or sector uh, as far as their customers. Next slide. Here is the consensus um, eagle or equity analysis guide on uh, EPAM systems and uh, the calculations that underlie that 27.8. And uh, I'll compare it with my judgments in a later slide. So we'll go on to the next slide. This is a uh, the Chronicle, Ken in particular likes looking at this uh, a lot, and I usually do, although I don't frequently mention it uh, on the round table, but I will always take a look at it. I like to see a good steady quality line, that's the blue line that uh, has the arrow coming in from the left, or an up trend, you see relatively steady, although there was a little bit of a dip there for a little while, but uh, it's in the upswing, but even with the dip, it was still in the excellent uh, category and is going in the right direction. And again, notice the return line, uh, which is uh, both the 
par, uh, which is the red line, as well as the relative par, which is the par relative to the rest of the mar or relative to my par, the rest of the market. Both of those lines are relatively close to historic highs, which are good, comfortable places uh, that I like to uh, consider buying stocks. Next slide. Um, again, because of the uh, yellow um, uh, ranking uh, of the par being uh, over 20 points above my par, one question that I have, is there something going on in the company that maybe I've missed or maybe the market, even if the, the market may be wrong, has overreacted to or is concerned about? And you will notice the um, right-hand column, the actual results for the last quarter of 2016, the company did miss analyst estimates by just a little bit, um, two cents, and it really did not take a price hit as a result of it, but that was out there. Um, but what really matters to me is the next chunk of numbers, taking a look at the projected trends. And if you notice, the far left-hand column is the current quarter projected earnings. You see it's gone down by about a penny over the last 90 days, although it actually has jumped uh, a penny in the last 30 days. So that's, I gave it a very tiny uh, down arrow. You see the next quarter is, has been even the whole time. The current year is very slightly up. And next year, which would be 2018, a little bit more up, but again, nothing significant. All of that saying, it does not look like uh, the market uh, or the analysts are concerned about any decline in the company or that there's not deteriorating uh, anticipated results, which could uh, sometime account for uh, yellow, very high par values. Next slide. Here's just the comparison between my judgments, which I'll give you the details in the next slide, and the um, default consensus judgments on manifest. Uh, notice I've uh, dropped the growth a little bit from 24 to 20, and that is right in line with the company's projections for fiscal 2017. They're looking at a 20% uh, sales growth. I've kept the net margin at the constant level where it is currently at 8%, whereas the analysts think that there's room for margin expansion. PEs are about the same, and running all of that through, you see the uh, difference in the par, and of course my par size par is within the green, which means it falls between 5 and 10 points above my par. It's actually about seven points above my par or the market. And then the detail on my judgments, the next slide. I just want, I thought I'd jump in here just for a second side. Sure. This, this company was just picked up in the, in the standard edition coverage at value line um, in the last cycle. And, and I did not add it in. I, I basically missed it because they had not issued their 2018 with a lot of these type of companies, what we will wait uh, in the first quarter of the year, we'll kind of drag our feet a little bit so that we get another data point as the companies get come out with their analyst consensus estimates for 2017 and 2018. And they hadn't done that yet, so I, I went over them. But uh, in, the, in the upcoming update, about a month out, what you will probably see happen, I'm sitting here looking at the value line right now, you're probably going to see that growth number jump down to or drop down to where Psi is, and the net margin looks like it's going to be fairly close to that too. So I, I think this is a good example of when you see a, a number like that 27.8%, again, this is a case where more information and not a, not a whole lot of difference, um, dropping from 24 to 20 and maybe trimming a little bit off the net margin can actually... Uh, trim that 27% pretty quickly. So just be on the lookout for that. That'll be out with uh, the next update, I think. Right. Go okay. Ahead. Very. Uh, thank you, Mark, for pointing that out. And again, uh, I let me stress that you know it's easy 
to go in and just say, well, gee, that's a huge yellow number. That's lofty number, so I will just come in and lower sales growth. I'll just lower margin and low. Woo! Watch what happens. And you know that that's a. I'm super conservative, but be sure and do your homework and do things like checking what the analyst trends are. Read what management's estimates are. Watch your quality figures and all of those sorts of things because if you know. If, if it's high and lofty and you just go arbitrarily trimming things to get it out of the nosebleed area, but you've got junk, junk is still junk at any price. So, so don't be arbitrary about it. But it is kind of interesting to hear. I was not aware of the value line uh, coming out, Mark, but it is kind of interesting how that tends to, to track a, a bit closer to where, where my numbers are have come in yeah they'll be and closer then to you. Are, i'm sorry i said they'll be closer to you yes yes so um so again that's that's why you know high yellows don't necessarily scare me if it's a high quality company and then you you do a little bit of digging and and come up with with um with numbers and also realize sometimes a company just takes a hit i mean you heard ken mention cognizant uh, earlier, and of course this was in the Great Recession or coming out of the Great Recession, I also hit Cognizant pretty well. And, and it was a very high number because it had been tremendously beaten down. Uh, so you can have high quality companies with high high um, PARs and, and it's, it still can be a rational investment. But you, you need to, to watch it because a few of us have been burned writing some down too uh, as well. All of us say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's uh, never happened to me. No. <laughs> it will, Mark. It will. Uh, and again, here you see the 20% growth, the net margin, the PE, and uh, getting the 20 uh, or the 12.5. So again, I'm doubling down and uh, adding another thousand dollars of EPAM to the portfolio and soliciting your vote when it comes to poll time. And one last comment, the value line report at, at mentions a fairly massive contract win with UBS, the largest wealth manager in the world. So that's uh, fairly recent news that probably doesn't hurt a bit. All right, let's go ahead and switch gears to uh, drugstores and health plans. And Well, my story time. about my story about coming up with CVS is a little bit unique this time. Uh, I've been preparing for uh, presentations that I'm making in Miami this coming Saturday and then uh, actually in, in Plantation, Florida this coming Saturday. And then uh, Mark and I will be uh, traveling to Minneapolis. Uh, I'm going to be going to Kansas City. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk about in these presentations was the triple play. So I sat down about... Uh, three or four days ago and started wetting my index finger and reading through my paper copies of value line uh, searching for triple play candidates uh, I guess I never expected to find a company that I not only owned but that I had done a considerable amount of study on uh, coming up as a potential triple play but that's exactly what happened with CVS if you'd click it first mark you know, if you listen to me closer in the Tulsa audience, it uh, wouldn't have been such a surprise. <laughs> uh, CVS Pharmacy, which is the way you know, most of you know the company, and if you click again, Mark, is now CVS Health. That's the official name of the the company right now. So if you're you're trying to do an SSG, make sure you get the right company name. Uh, CVS Health is a much a broader based company than CVS Pharmacy used to be. The pharmacy chain is still there, uh, but they now have a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager attached to them. They have some drug distributions. They're operating um, uh, pharmacies within Target stores, and they're doing a lot of things that you would not have expected the normal CVS drugstore chain to have done maybe a dozen uh, or 15 years ago. Click again, please, Mark. 
I started my study uh, once I, uh, I had looked at the paper value line. I started my study uh, by going to the website, the new value line website. It's not so new anymore, but what I think a lot of people aren't realizing is that this website uh, updates stocks uh, on a much faster rotation than the once every quarter update that many of you are used to getting with the paper copies. Uh, the numbers that appear on the website, on the front of the website, are the most current. And here I'm, I've circled the safety number, a uh, very, very high quality balance sheet for this company, a safety ranking of one. And most of you understand that Value Line's timeliness rankings are fairly short term uh, oriented, uh, but we're, we're looking at, at uh, a stock that Value Line is indicating probably will outperform the market in the next six to 12 months. Uh, that's a rank of two, and that's a pretty decent uh, rank short term. Uh, these are up to date because the next slide, if you click there, Mark, the next slide is the PDF that came out just about a week and a half ago. And you'll notice that the timeliness rank on this PDF document, this single sheet value line report, is a three. So what I'm telling you is that once you come up with a paper copy, uh, you might want to check the website itself. The information on the website is more up to date than the information on the PDF, and that's true for all of the numbers everywhere. They will, they will not be afraid to adjust the numbers on the website so that they no longer match the PDF. The chances of the, there not being a match get greater, of course, as the age of the PDF goes from one month to two months to three months. But here I am looking at a PDF that was only about a week and a half old. So things are changing for the company and according to Value Line at least for the better. I added a note to this Value Line sheet that at the beginning of the day today, CVS was trading at about $79. The PDF shows about an $81 uh, recent price. So I can trust most of these percentages to be fairly accurate. Um, if I would have seen this stock opening up at $100 or opening up at $60, then I would have had to adjust my thinking about forward projections. So I mentioned triple play. There's three things that Mr. Nicholson said should be true about a triple play to make it a very, very interesting type of investment. Uh, the first thing is a depressed stock price. And the way that I am interpreting a depressed stock price as far as a value line sheet is concerned is I'm looking at the projections going into the future, three to five years, the annual low and high projections. And I'd like to see them significantly above where the market average is. On the front of this value line sheet, uh, the market averages were about six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent, depending on whether you decided value line was giving you a number three years in the future or four years in the future or five years in the future. Um, I don't care whether it's three, four, five. When I'm looking at returns of 15 to 20 percent, that to me says that the price right now is significantly uh, lowered. So I'm looking at uh, number one of the triple play. Number two is I'd like to see some room for PE expansion. So I'm checking the PE at the top of the page, the 14, and now I'm looking at the three to five year projected PE. Notice that I have it circled down there around 16. There's PE expansion, and that's leg two of the triple play. Leg three has to do with the possibility to improve margins. And I'm looking at the 2016 margin, which I've boxed in. I'm looking at the 2017 and 2018 uh, estimates going forward, and then I'm comparing that to the three to five year estimate for margins. And again, I am seeing some room from where the margins exist today to where they might be three to five years from now. 
Uh, so while that last one is a little bit weaker than I'd like, I still think CVS is is at least uh, a, a stock that you should consider as this idea of triple play. And Nicholson said there'll be a lot of them at the end of a strong bear market, but they'll be kind of hard to find in the middle or at the end of a bull market. Well, I had to go through a lot of different sheets to come up with CVS Health as a particular triple play. I had just presented CVS for the portfolio last November, so I'm going to present it again. Click again, please, Mark. I went to the page on Manifest for CVS Health, and I focused on the fact that even if I'm wrong and CVS kind of stays in a narrow trading range uh, for the next five or six months, uh, I'm going to be rewarded. It pays a pretty nice dividend, about 2% plus uh, as far as the dividend's concerned. And of course, that yield goes up as the price goes down and vice versa. But I, I like buying a big company if there's a par significantly above 7 8%. And on top of that, I'm getting some kind of a yield in order to hold this a larger company in my portfolio. Another slide, please, Mark. Uh, Cy had indicated that I really do like to look at the Chronicle, and it's one of my favorite sources. This sits at the bottom of that page that we just got off of. If you just scroll all the way down to the bottom of the particular stock page, you'll see the Chronicle. And again, just as Cy explained, I'm looking for a quality line that even either stays consistent up near the top of the range or is showing improvement during that time. Here's CVS quality up near 100% for, I don't know, two, three, four years. So I'm pretty happy about that. And then I really like to see a stock with a high quality trading at a par value that historically for the last three or four or five years is really above anything or any place that it's traded at. Now this high par was reached uh, maybe a number of months ago, maybe two or three months ago, and it's above 20. The par right now that I'm going to suggest is uh, convenient is probably somewhere around 14 or 15, but I'm looking at this chart and I'm looking and you know, 14 or 15 is still near the historic top of this trading range. In other words, I'm finding a really, really large, really, really high quality dividend paying company with an outsized potential going forward. Uh, I love companies like that. I like to add them to my portfolio. Uh, usually I can keep them in my portfolio three, four, five, six, seven years uh, and do a nice job of making some cash when I find a candidate like this. Another click, please, Mark. I went to the Eagle for CVS and, uh, you know, I tended to agree with most of the judgments that were being made. And when I finished this whole Eagle out, I got about a 14%. I'll tell you that my, what I considered to be a very reasonable, very conservative, classical SSG, uh, that came out at 145 So I'm looking at, at two sources. Uh, and they're each kind of nudging the other and they're validating each other. Uh, the 14.5 from my classic SSG validates the 13.9 from the Manifest uh, investing site and vice versa. The 13.9 from Manifest makes me feel real good about the 14.5 from my classic SSG. All in all, I can't find anything not to like. I, you know, I, everything that I read about CVS says that it's liable to have a fairly slow year for the next nine to 12 months. It's liable to be fairly straight, fairly uh, even in growth and uh, not do any kind of barn burning, not get anybody real excited. Well, that's what I'll take the 2% dividend for holding it for. Uh, but into the future, there's not an analyst opinion that I've read 
that doesn't predict that CVS uh, probably will be making really good earnings growth, really good sales growth, and that you can expect returns somewhere in the 12 to 17 percent range, depending on how conservative or aggressive you are in putting your stock selection guide and your eagles together. So I'm going to add another holding for CVS Health into our uh, portfolio. Yeah, it's hard not to like that one. By the way, your presentation is is approved by my mother, who is a CVS shareholder. A st story that I shared with the Tulsa audience, I made one of those all-time bad investment uh, advice moves a few years ago. Uh, Mom and Dad were both looking for a home for some IRA funds a few years ago, and I recommended CVS to Mom and Walgreens to Dad. And uh, don't ever do that. Uh, it, it basically guaranteed that every time I came home, I slept in the driveway when I visited them. So, no, they're actually both both doing well. Those companies have actually both performed pretty well. All right, thanks, Ken. It's a, an accumulation of CBS Health for the portfolio, and I'm going to actually reinforce it here in a minute. All right, what I thought I would do, we're close to April Fool's Day, so I thought we'd spend just a tiny moment with the Motley Fools. Uh, that tiny moment is in the form of a screen. A lot of times I use the ivory soap screen, but today what I did is I said I'm going to go in and I'm going to look for just a couple of things. Uh, companies that are ranked very high with respect to their return forecast, the PAR, and their quality. That's what these two characteristics build the manifest rank, so I wanted to find companies that those two characteristics are in the top 2% of all companies. And then I also wanted to do to uh, lean on the, the Motley Fool Caps community a little bit. This thing called the CASPI rating is uh, what they basically do is keep track of the stock selections of a number of people out there in the community and what they call all-stars that seem to have uh, selections work out well more often. For example, my uh, outperformance accuracy over there is is, is probably 65-70% and ranking in the top uh, 5 or 10% of all participants. So they would actually count my perspective on, you know, a company like CVS or whatever in the rankings. And I wanted to find companies that we think highly of in term of qual terms of quality that have we have a high expectation in terms of the return forecast or PAR that also aligns with the consensus of the Motley Fool stock selection of people at the CAPS experiment. That's what you see on the screen. Just five stocks meet that criteria. Very good long-term forecast and quality and uh, elevated expectations within the community. Again, Mesa Labs, as I said a few minutes ago, we may see a little bit of a downdraft as the fundamentals are adjusted, very much like what we saw with Psy and EPAM. Um, as more information becomes available, things slow down a tiny bit, that PE gets trimmed, and that number may come down a little bit. Microchip technology is in this week's update. It's got pretty decent, uh, a pretty decent outlook across the board. And again, as we said, that's in our form of a buy zone or a sweet spot with a very high quality rating, very decent growth rate. That won't hurt our tracking portfolio a bit. And then other companies that we know that are maybe just a little bit less exciting, but uh, certainly qualify as pretty decent studies. Buffalo Wild Wings, uh, a company that we have featured here at the round table and has been uh, in and out of my personal portfolio a couple times over the last 10 years. Um, Carter's in the clothing business. And McKesson, again, almost aligning a little bit with Ken's work on CVS Health. They're at, at one point in the supply chain to companies like uh, CVS Health. They're uh, a distributor of health products. So those, those five are pretty decent studies. I'm going to go with microchip technology for tonight um, as I walk through what we look at. Microchip technology, again, kind of a mid-sized company, interesting area. I've had a love affair with linear technology for a number of years, and Ken has teased me about it for a number of years. Well, this is my replacement for microchip for uh, linear technology because, uh, unfortunately, uh, linear technology has disappeared. 
They were swallowed up by analog devices, ticker symbol ADI, so linear technology is now a part of that. If you go back, if you've been a Better Investing uh, member for, for a few years, there were multiple linear technology uh, stocks to study and undervalued stock features in Better Investing magazine. And I see a lot of that same type of capability from microchip technology. They do a lot of analog stuff, and again, analog is just communicating between devices and things that keep track of information. They make their their chips are almost somewhat industrial, somewhat simpler. Uh, in fact, they face a little bit less competition because they're not trying to do wild, sexy things like Nvidia. But um, you can see on the medical device picture in here. By the way, this is a presentation that was given on March second at the. I believe Morgan Stanley conference by the two gentlemen in the lower right hand corner from microchip technology. This is on the investor relations section of microchip. Um, I think it's microchip.com. I'll double check that in the Q&A, but if it's not that, it's microchiptechnology.com. And you can actually just dive into the investor relations and uh, this presentation is there from laptops to tablets to uh, the automotive stuff of keeping track of all all types of information exchange uh, on uh, automobiles. And this is what those gentlemen described as what is going on in their business. The, their, their biggest area of, of business is in these microcontrollers, they abbreviate that MCU. And uh, again, in this Internet of Things as is shown down there in point three, you know, talking to your, your garage door and your thermostat and your refrigerator and the basement lights and all that kind of stuff, they, are, they make the nuts and bolts, chips and uh, electronic hardware that goes with that stuff. Along with point number four, the automotive uh, electronics and dealing with remote start and keyless entry and all that kind of stuff, they're involved in those areas. The areas of security, uh, chips that are basically designed to uh, help avoid some of the nastiness of the, the hackers that probably used to work for EPAM system. No, I didn't say that. Um, anyhow, these guys are, are, are in the Internet of Things sphere of opportunity and, and capitalizing on it quite well. Again, uh, targeting a, a niche that's, you know, not attacked by a lot of the major players because again these guys are going up against Intel and Texas Instruments and other companies like that so it's a uh, it's it's definitely a battle so here we'll just take a quick look at the company you can see it's not going to be completely up straight and parallel it's going to have some um, rocky bumps in it as you can see from the visual analysis on the right Sales, however, have been fairly consistent with a little bit of up and down roller coaster type motion, but tracking fairly well. They are an acquisitor. They they do merge and acquire companies and uh, have actually been fairly successful at it. Um, I don't remember if they were actually in the running for linear technology, but I wouldn't be surprised to find that they were attempting to to go after them also, and apparently unsuccessfully. But uh, the profitability again fairly steady. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have some bumps in, in it due to the nature of the business, but uh, certainly uh, as close to up straight and parallel as you, as you can expect with uh, a company in this industry. The growth rate that you, you see is going to be in that 10 to 14% range, especially if you focus in on the right-hand side of the chart. Again, for any time you're dealing with a merger and acquisition type company that is willing to engage in that type of activity, you have to be careful because the data will be skewed. Um, and distorted the farther back you go because they do not restate uh, the historical numbers. So if you really want to focus in on the company that you are, the new company, you want to be focusing on the right-hand side of any chart in the case of a company like this. And again, the growth rate there is going to be in that 11 to 14 percent range on the right-hand side. Again, kind of a medium-sized, borderline small company, but uh, playing in a, a fairly rich field of opportunity. Um, their profitability as presented by the net margin has been again remarkably consistent for this type of business. We used to see this from linear technology with a few more percentage points on it, but uh, certainly a healthy trend 
you know, even through some of those acquisitions, maintaining that profitability at leadership levels and uh, delivering consistency and results. The PE ratio as the company has grown, has matured, and seems to be entering into a kind of a landing zone. I would say anything in that uh, mid-teens is a defensible type number for this type of company. So again, we're looking at the major assumptions of uh, it came out, as I said, in the, the fairly recent value line. The, the, in fact, the value line that is dated today actually has a price that came from that date. So 324, the price is actually a week hold on the PDF, by the way. Um, we're looking at a company with about $3.5 billion in sales. And, the, and then again, we're talking about uh, a growth rate in that 11 to 14% range. Interestingly enough, the consensus line aligns with value line pretty well. We're looking at uh, a profit margin in that 28.9% range. That's this number right here. It's certainly credible, and uh, it would seem to be achievable in a market, you know, full of opportunity, and uh, these guys seem to be executing pretty well. Um, Shares outstanding, again, in the low 200s, gives you earnings estimates in the 8 to 850 range going forward. PEs, in the, again, that kind of um, mid-teens area leads to a return forecast in the 15% range. Value line on the low side comes in with a 7%. Again, value line with companies like this will tend to be somewhat pessimistic most of the time. Um, the, the bumpiness and the roller coaster nature of some of the more cyclical type businesses seems to bother them a little bit, and uh, you, you will see, see a little bit lower return forecasts from time to time for companies like this. So again, we're looking at a company in that 11 to 14 percent growth range, high 20s for profitability on the net margin, and a PE of 15 or 16, which again is, is not exactly nosebleed, delivering a return forecast in the 14 or 15 percent range. Here's a look at the price chart, which shows a pretty good run-up. Uh, uh, the economics have been improving in the semiconductor industry. Those of you that are familiar with NVIDIA or Micron or follow some of those type of companies, you've seen fairly explosive returns over the last year, and uh, Microchip has not sit, been sitting this one out. They've actually come from the high 30s up to the 70 range, so they have been chugging along pretty well, which is why I'm going to do something we never do around here. I'm uh, going to say I, I like everything that I heard about the company fundamentally. I'm okay with it, but I also see the reality that this company quite often takes dips, dips in stock price along the way. This is a 10-year chart, and you can see that the number of times that they've come back and actually touched on this, this rolling one-year average, so it's a 12-month average actually is quite often. So what that is suggesting to me is it would not be completely uh, unusual for this company to drop down into the 60 range. At some point in the near future, if we get just that speed bump or that hiccup, certainly if the stock market corrects 10 to 20 percent, this company will probably follow that or lead it. And uh, what I'm going to do is say I want microchip technology. I like everything about it. It reminds me of linear technology, but I don't want to pay $73 for it. I want to pay $60. So I'm going to put in basically a limit order at $60. Uh, we'll put an alert in place. If it gets down to $60, we're going to latch on to it. And uh, that's the way I would like to go. Here's a, just a quick look at the Morningstar take on the company, and again, their fair value estimate is 68, so I'm pretty comfortable coming in just a little bit underneath that, down around 60. You can see that uh, Morningstar would say wait until it's down in the high 40s or approaching 50 to buy. Um, here's a quick analysis. You can, you can read this. I shared this just to remind everybody that Morningstar does have a pretty good summary of companies. Um, as you're making a presentation to your club partners, it can remind you to take a look at some of the highlights. Again, the MCU stands for that uh, microcontrollers. And um, what I used to do in my investment clubs, if I wanted to persuade the club to buy, I would just leave off the bear thing and, and use the bull thing. And then if I was trying to prevent somebody from uh, having a nomination successful at the end, I would never do this. But if I was trying to prevent the nomination, I would just share the bears part. But uh, 
No, I'm kidding. But you, you can see that you can basically build a case on one side or the other for many companies. Taking a look at that. And then I'm just going to point out to Mr. Kabul that if you were paying attention, we came out just three weeks ago with the Fave 5 Triple Play Edition, which just reinforces the stuff that he had to say about <laughs> looking for a forecast that can explode and um, the chance for profit enhancement and PE expansion. And five fairly interesting companies, including CVS Health, showed up. So um, if I were voting tonight, I'd be voting for that one because I'm looking down here, and this is fairly current stuff. It's a couple weeks old now, but I find it kind of intriguing that companies like, I think these are just kind of turbulent right now, but the top one and the bottom one I, I find very interesting because their long-term fundamentals are quite strong. Value line agrees that their long-term fundamentals are quite strong, and you actually have a very strong consensus from Morningstar, S&P, and places like, and then even over the next one-year period where, as Ken was saying, is going to be perhaps slightly sluggish for CVS Health. By the way, Goldman Sachs thinks they might take off. That's kind of an interesting point. But look at these numbers down here for ABB, or ABB, ABBV. And uh, I would be shopping amongst CVS, CVS Health and ABV if I was really pushing for a, a situation. But I'm going to go ahead and add my limit order for microchip to our tracking portfolio. But if I was voting tonight, I'd vote for CBS Health. Let's go back. We'll come back to this during the Q&A, Ken. Go ahead. Let's okay. Go uh, then I'm going to run the polls now. And let me just get it up here if I can. And let's launch it. There we go. If you're from Chicago, you have five. Eight if you're from the south side. I don't know. Can I actually see the polls yet, Ken? Have they made that possible yet? They haven't. No, no. Only I get to see them. That's why I win all the time, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're up to about 80% voting, folks. Uh, just take your mouse and click on the one you think you'd like. Uh, I'd love to get us up to 90% voting if we could. 87, 88. All right, I'm counting backwards in my head from 10. Just takes one more person to jump us up to that 90% uh, there. Almost must be 89.3. <laughs> okay, there we went. We went over 90%, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. And here are the results. And we're going to take a double position in CVS a single position in EPAM. We're going to uh, put a limit order in for microchip technology. And a couple of folks didn't like, well, one folk at least didn't like any of them uh, to invest in right now. Mark and, and Cy, we do have some questions. We have a couple of hands in the air. So let me see if I can get back. There we go. Mark is showing the things that are coming up in the near future that uh, he or I or Sai are going to be speaking at. But if you give me a chance to get to the uh, things, let's start with Ed Smith. Ed, I'm going to unmute you and take your hand down. So you go ahead and ask your question. If I can get you unmuted, that is. And Ken, I'm going to go ahead and sign off on the recording to keep the size down, and maybe that will help with getting it posted uh, more quickly. All right. So thanks, everybody, and uh, th thanks so much for uh, attending. We hope you walk away with some good ideas to study. We are going to stay for some Q&A. We'll take a look at Hugh's hot list. But, uh, again, thanks, and we look forward to seeing all of you at some point in the future on the road or back here at the roundtable. Thanks so much. I was having difficulty.